Well, I'm, I'm, my name is Jeremy Van Diemen. Um, I grew up in the church. I'm a third generation Seventh-day Adventist. Um, I went through our school system 10 plus years. Um, and over time, I began to see that I'm actually a homosexual. And that was a very, very difficult thing for me. Um, it, it was a very long journey and it involved a lot of um, sometimes heartbreaking things, but in the end, you know, I, I, I believe God stuck with me and I, I have always been a searcher for tr truth. I've always been honest with myself. I've always been open to, you know, what I believed God's impressions were. And as a result, I'm back with him. This time to stay. One of the best things I did for myself, one of the best favors I did for myself um, was read the nine volumes of the Testimonies to the Church. Um, you know, I, I really believe that there was a reason why those letters, those personal letters were written. And, you know, Ellen White herself says that they cover nearly the cases of everyone. Um, I think we have to understand that we are living in a fallen world, world that we are all descendants from Adam and Eve who sinned. And that part of our legacy is biological. In some instances, it might be a physical aberration, like for example, <clears throat> the man who was born blind in John 9, you know, and his, the disciples of Jesus came to Jesus and asked him, you know, whose sin resulted in this man being born blind? Was it the man or was it his parents or somebody Else. And so Jesus says, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. So in other words, God is not going to intervene when we inherit something that is unfavorable. He's not going to take us to Eden with an unfallen nature that Adam and Eve had before the fall. We are all born into the world with a certain complex of things you know it could be something like homosexuality it could be some kind of physical thing or it could be something anything that results in in you know weakness or in 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 something that causes you to go against the clear word of god this is something to look at as a hereditary weakness that you didn't ask for but that is your responsibility and when I, when, I, when I saw that, when I looked at that, I began to realize that my homosexuality, rather than being a disadvantage, is actually the context in which the grace of God can work so that I can be a unique exhibit of His power. And so because of that, I'm actually happy to be gay. I no longer am praying for God to change me. You know. First, first of all, I know that I don't have to live that life. I can resist it. I can, I can have God in my life. I can have Christ in my life by my side. I can always be meditating on him and filling my heart with his power so that I, when I look at these things that were such a pull before, you know, they, they just have lost their power over time. You know, what was temptations at one time is no longer a temptation. I can look at these things in the face and not feel drawn to them. You know, and so um, what I think um, needs to be understood is, is that a temptation isn't necessarily something that is a suggestion from outside. It can just be, you know, um, Satan resonating on something that he knows is in your heart, that he knows you've inherited. Um, but, w but whether it's an internal weakness or whether it's an e external temptation, we all are able to resist everything successfully if we hook up successfully with God. You know, in our own power, we're not going to do that. We're going to gravitate to whatever our, our internal makeup leads us to. You know, if we have a weakness for this, that's what we're going to go to. If we have a weakness for that, that's what we're going to go to. As a gay person, my weakness is probably sexuality, period. I, I was hypersexed. Uh, but I think a particular type of sex as well but you know you you have to just break that connection between what is in your heart and the temptations that are out there 
and just learn to connect with supernatural power and live and live the divine life. This Christ in you, the hope of glory, is a lesson that took me a long time to learn. But this is the New Testament teaching. You know, we, we, are, we are receptacles for the grace of God in order to show what that can do against the forces of evil in the world. So to the extent that we're able to uh, resist temptation, whether it springs from something within, like homosexuality, or whether it's something totally external, uh, this is our opportunity to shine for God. This is our opportunity to show that we are truly a son of God in the making. You know? That's how I look at it now. You know, whatever the dis disadvantages you start off with life with, that's your, that's your ticket to a unique exhibit of grace. You know, so praise God for whatever weaknesses you have. You know, because in the end, it doesn't have to be something that overcomes you. You can overcome it. This is, this is where I think being single is, a, is an advantage. You know, if you are interacting with another fallen person, you know, in a marriage or in some kind of relationship, what this means is, is that, you know, part of your energies has to be diverted in order to, you know, either be in harmony with this person or patch up something between you when there's no harmony. When you're by yourself, all you have to do is just, is just close your eyes, shut out the world, shut out work or whatever. You know, you can do it in the privacy of your bedroom, which is where I, I always do it. And I start praying. I start, you know, I'm a, I'm a big memorizer of the Bible. You know, over the years I've memorized five complete books of the Bible. And one of my favorite ones is First John. You know, and a lot of times I'll just start at the beginning and just start reciting. And I'll just start giving myself to Jesus. You know, he says, abide in me and I in you. And I, I, I just have this, this, this way of visualizing that. And I do that. And over time, usually about a half an hour, you know, um, you, can, you can start feeling lifted. You can start feeling the Holy Spirit all around you, enclosing you in a recognition that you are a son of God. And this kind of feeling, I mean, it is a feeling. You can feel the love. You can feel, there's a brilliant joy that you can feel. There's a peace, a powerful peace. There's also the sense of wisdom, you know, ancient wisdom, where you are totally known you are totally accepted for what you are becoming in Christ because he is in the heavenly sanctuary now, adding his perfect merits to whatever your offering is at that point, you know, which is defiled because of your fallen nature. But he is adding his merits to whatever your offering is, and it's a perfect sacrifice. I, I mean, it's a perfect offering. So you don't have to worry about, you know, whether it meets God's standard or not because God is, or Jesus is there, adding his perfection to that. And so internalizing that and having him, you know what my mom used to say, and she was a very, very spiritual lady. Um, she used to say, you feel the Holy Spirit from your toes all the way to your head. You just, you just feel all that love. And you, what you have to do is, is find a way to, to be contrite um, and, to, and to, of course, be humble because, you know, God says he dwells in this high and holy place but also with the humble and the contrite in heart. And so when you have these qualities in your heart, that, that is what enables Christ to dwell in you. If you are sitting there kind of home hum or uh, detached or self-sufficient in any way, God is not going to fill you. He is not going to fill you and you will never feel him. You will never even know that he's there. But when you meet the conditions, when you are poor in spirit, when you are, you know, really feeling your need, when you are really contrite, not just because you've done some kind of sin, but just because, you know, you are fallen and, 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 you, and you are attracted to the purity of Christ. When you feel these qualities in the heart, this is when you feel the lifting power of God. And when you have this on a daily basis, I mean, I guess you could almost call it like spiritual sex. It's, it's like you're, you're, you're confirming your relationship with God. You know, it's something you don't forget. There are sometimes, like I drive through the mountains on a, on, a, uh, on a way to an appointment or, 
you know, even driving around town, and I run these texts through my mind, and I, I concentrate on it, and I, 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 I just open my mind to the presence of God, and it lifts you, you know? And when you have tasted that, you cannot go back to a life, you know, which is just purely um, sensual pleasure, or even something like appetite, or any kind of vanity, or anything that is characteristic of this world. You know, these things fade. All you want to do, all you, you know, you're like a flower turning to the sun. All you want is just to be filled with God. That's all you want. That's what you really, really want. And when you, God gives you what you really want. And when you really want Him, He fills you. And when He fills you, there is no chance that you're going to fall. There is no chance. You can look at these temptations, and it's like you're walking on water. There's no chance that you can fall. But you know, if, if you don't do your part and if you don't actively seek God, if you don't meet the conditions of humility, of contrition, you know, of poor in spirit, um, if you're full of yourself, um, which I think I was at one time when I was basically demanding God to change me, mm -hmm. you know, because of that condition in my heart, God couldn't, couldn't do anything with me because I was basically commanding Him what to do, you know. I was saying, well, you know, you're saying that homosexuality is wrong, so change me into a heterosexual now. There's nothing in my life that's preventing you from doing it. I know that you can do that. Why aren't you doing it? Years are going by, I'm praying, and you're not, I'm doing my part, you're not doing yours. You know, that kind of attitude drives the spirit out of your heart. And there's no chance for any real connection. There's no chance that you're going to feel that power that enables you to resist temptation. So I, I think being a, sex, a successful Christian in any line where you know that you have weaknesses um, uh, that, that can cause you to fall is all about learning how to work cooperatively with God, how to nurture the conditions in the heart that bring His presence into your heart. Because when He is there, you feel it. You feel it. it I'm, I, I'm not trying to say, Let's have religion by feeling, <clears throat> uh, you know, because I think you do have to exercise faith when things don't look good and when they don't feel good. And you also have to do your part in setting time aside to study the inspired sources, which in my mind is the Bible and Ellen White. There's nothing else. And to me, they're both equal. Uh, you have to do your part, do your homework, and then the Holy Spirit brings these things into your mind, and then you give yourself to them. But you empty self. You know, divinity is never going to connect with you when, when you when you are full of yourself. It just does not happen. I've, I've tried it. It doesn't happen. You have to empty yourself, you know? And sometimes, uh, sometimes in order to make that first connection, I think the first connection is always hardest. After you understand how to do it, um, it becomes a little bit easier. Um, but I know how to channel with God at this point. You know, and sometimes it takes, sometimes it takes fasting, uh, but, but you have to get the world out of your mind, and you have to be fully attentive, and you have to meet the conditions that are laid down in inspiration. And when you do, it happens. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can feel it. And when you have that, you can look at temptation, you can almost laugh at it. You know, because I, I, I can't always have my Bible with me. And when I'm standing in a line at a bank or a supermarket, I really find it very useful to run these texts in my mind because the more you, you know, when you think about it long enough to memorize it, you can get a feel for what it actually means. And especially when you've read the whole book and all the books by this writer many, many times, you can feel what the, what the sensation in these texts are. And I, I, I find Bible memory is, is a wonderful tune, tool for resisting temptation because when the temptation hits, you know, somehow the Holy Spirit brings a text that you weren't even thinking of. It, it, it comes into your mind, and that helps you to get into the frame of mind where Christ can actually be in you. So Bible, Bible memory, I think, is very, very important. I would not do without it. Well, I think that there's probably at least two things that can be done, probably at least three. I think the first thing that I'm very fortunate to have had 
you know, one of the parents has to be spiritual. You know, there has to be an example there. You know, I'm not so certain what's going to happen with young people who, who are coming, coming in from the world where they never had any kind of example. But in my case, I had a very godly mother, a very spiritual mother who was exactly what she talked. And she didn't talk a lot, but she, she did a lot of things. And she was very, very plain and very Christ-centered and very into this concept of, you know, you cannot boast of anything because God is doing so much for you. you the best that you can do is be grateful and humble. You know, I had that day in and day out from the time I was born, you know, till the time I went off to boarding school at 13 years old. I had that. And I believe um, that at the moment of decision for me, the example of my mother is what tipped it. Now, I, I, uh, I don't want to talk about my father. He was a good man. He did a lot for the church, um, but he never affected me in the same way that my mother did because she, she just had a connection, you know. And she used to talk to me about establishing a connection with God, how to fill your heart with Him. So I, I know that I'm not inventing this. This is something that I inherited from her. Um, so I think, you know, with the concern that older generations have for the younger generations, the first, the first thing that they can do is be an example themselves. You know, walk the walk that they are talking themselves. You know, because kids see things, and they don't always say that they're seeing it, but they see it. They see it all. They see the, they see the hypocrisy. They, they see, um, you know, all these little things that, that, that don't add up. Um, but they also see genuine truth. This is one thing about it. Even a small kid, a small kid can, can appreciate or can feel when the Holy Spirit is there. You see, and so I think we, we as older, as an older generation in the church, we need to set the example for the younger ones. And whether they say it or not, they will feel if it's genuine. That is number one. Number two, I think um, there, there has to be an atmosphere in which kids can feel that they can come and talk to us about anything. I really think that that was missing in my experience. Now, I have to say uh, with my mother, you know, she was a wonderful lady. My dad was a wonderful man. But their culture, South African culture, <sighs> you just don't talk about sex. Sex doesn't happen, you know. Uh, and so a sexual problem, you know, they were not the ones to talk to. But 30, 40 years ago, this was generally the way it was in the church as well. You know, nobody who had a sexual problem could talk to anybody about it. And so it was all underground. I think now we are at a point in the history, at the development of the history of the world, you know, where we have racial equality, we have gender equality, we have, we have the understanding that homosexual is biological. You know, we can start talking about these things intelligently. And I don't think a kid um, who asks a question about sexuality is too young to be treated seriously enough to talk about it seriously from an adult. I think that they would feel included. I think that they would feel privileged to talk to somebody who's experienced, you know, who has some kind of wisdom, but who is also spiritual, who, who is evidently spiritual. You know, so I, I, I think there, there has to be, first of all, be an example. And second of all, I think there has to be an, a willingness or an, um, there, there has to be the feeling that a kid can come and talk to me about anything that I'm not going to be shocked. I'm not going to betray their confidence. I'm not going to sit there in judgment. I'm just going to look at the problem objectively, and I'm going to offer my advice on it, but I'm not going to force them to go my way. You know, if my advice is worth anything, it's going to be self-evident that that is the way that it should be, in which case I don't have to force anything. I just have to concentrate on the message. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit is going to do things. I don't have to do it. I just have to do my part, which is be available, be not judgmental, be open, be loving, and be consistent. And the Holy Spirit will do the rest. That's what I believe.